The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. We're super excited today to have Dr. Lublina Antova, uh, to, who's the Principal Research Scientist at Datometry, to come give a talk about the kind of cool things they've been working at Datometry. Um, Dr. Antova got her PhD under Christoph Koch at uh, Cornell. And prior to that, she did a master's degree from Saarland University in Germany and a bachelor's degree in computer science from Sofia University in Bulgaria. Um, so she's been at Datometry since 2016? Uh, 15. 2015, okay. Uh, and again, the way we'll do this as we do every week, if you, have, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself, say who you are, where you're coming from, and, and ask your question, and feel free to interrupt any, anytime as possible, anytime you want. And as always, we want to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring this event. All right, uh, Lulena, the, the floor is yours. Go for it. And just tell me when you want to change slides. Yes. Uh, thanks, Andy, for the introduction. And uh, sorry, everyone, for the delay. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties. Um, so again, uh, my name is Lublena, and I will be talking about the technology we are developing at Datometry. And uh, yes, next slide, please. So the first sentence uh, that I'm going to start with, it's something that's probably pretty obvious to everyone, um, and that is that everybody, all the enterprises, uh, are moving to the cloud. And not only that, but they also need to move, uh, next slide, please, uh, their uh, data warehouses with it. And we know that the biggest uh, cloud providers, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, and, Reg and uh, Microsoft, sorry, uh, they, uh, they have their own uh, cloud offering for uh, data warehousing. And we've seen uh, some pretty big uh, IPO recently uh, that also shows that cloud warehouses uh, are pretty modern and pretty desirable uh, for the enterprises. Um, next slide, please. However, it turns out that adopting those cloud warehouses uh, is uh, one of the most challenging problems that IT faces. Um, and next slide. So this is a quote from Gartner, um, something that uh, for me as an, a former academic and uh, was not so obvious that actually even though that we have so many new and better uh, databases, it's actually pretty hard to migrate legacy applications to, to, to start using those new databases. And uh, what Gartner estimated is that 60% uh, or more of those migration projects uh, tend to run uh, over schedule, uh, they run over budget and ultimately fail. So the purpose of the talk is gonna be to answer why that is the case and also what we can do about it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a picture and I don't really want you to look at the individual boxes because I understand there's plenty of them. But that's uh, how a usual solution architecture uh, looks at uh, one of our customers. Um, so in the middle, you have your uh, data warehousing application, uh, data warehouse um, that's in the usual cylinder that we draw, uh, that we use for drawing uh, databases. And those data warehousing applications are usually used by two sets of applications. So on the left hand side is the ETL applications um, that pump and load data into the data warehouse. And on the right hand side, you have the reporting and analytical applications that uh, read and uh, make sense of, of, that, uh, of that data. So here uh, are the various components that are uh, involved in, in, those, um, in those applications and all the boxes painted in gray are the things you need to worry about if you wanna migrate that architecture uh, to a new data warehouse. So essentially replace the, the cylinder in the middle. Um, so let's simplify this a bit. Uh, can you move to the next slide? So again, this is the same picture, uh, just slightly simplified. Uh, this is your typical database stack. Uh, so on the bottom, you have your uh, data warehouse. And here I've uh, shown Teradata as one of the uh, kind of most prominent data warehousing uh, databases out there. And on the top, you have the applications. So those applications, uh, this will come as no surprise to you, but uh, those applications send queries uh, down to the database. Uh, this could be read queries, this could be queries that create objects, this could be queries that modify the objects. And the data warehouse evaluates those queries and returns the results back. And the application makes uh, something with those results, uh, whether it's uh, reporting, whether it's a visualization, uh, whether it's something else. So 
If you don't want to worry about migrating the applications, uh, our solution uh, proposes the following. So can I move to the next slide? Uh, we introduce a virtualization layer in the middle uh, that intercepts all the traffic that comes from the application, including queries, including um, loading requests and so on. And we do the real-time translation uh, of those requests down to the database, down to, down to the new database. Uh, so the application never needs to understand that something changed, that it's actually speaking to a cloud data warehouse. Uh, it still thinks it's talking to Teradata. And we take care of, of actually making those, uh, those things work in making those uh, requests compatible. Uh, next slide. So before I tell you how we do it, uh, I just wanted to give you an example of why translating SQL queries is, uh, is so difficult. Um, and I know it's probably obvious to most of you that have uh, seen at least one or more database engines. Uh, but this is a very simple example that is a simplified version of a customer query. And even in these few lines of SQL text, we already have um, some differences that make this query uh, non-portable to a new system. Uh, so if you can click. Uh, so yeah, so one, the first example is uh, just a custom keyword. Uh, so sorry for the font formatting, um, but essentially Teradata lets you um, abbreviate select into cell uh, and that's pretty simple, but the next one, uh, next slide please, uh, is a comparison between a date column and an integer, uh, and that's uh, typically not supported. Uh, so it, use, it, use, uh, it works on Teradata just because in Teradata dates are represented as integers, so there is a native comparison between the, between the two data values. Uh, there's some more differences, next slide. Uh, so that is a vector subquery, uh, that is standard in SQL, but uh, may not be supported on a, on a new and upcoming data warehouse. Uh, you compare two values against a set of two other values coming from a subquery. Next slide. And I was supposed to highlight the rank function, which is a non-standard way to express window functions in Teradata. And if you click to the next slide, there's also a qualify clause, which, uh, which is a proprietary Teradata clause that lets you uh, put window functions in a predicate. So it's similar to a having clause. Uh, so even in this uh, little example, there is a number of things that make the query non-portable. And if you try to rewrite it yourself, uh, if you click, there's gonna be a banner. Uh, you basically die from a thousand cuts uh, because there's so many things that you need to worry about. And this I, is just as- Out of curiosity, like, so in, in the previous slide you showed that like, you know, there's, you're feeding in from MicroStrategy, you're feeding in from whatever, Informatica. Like, mm -hmm. is it, out of curiosity, is, is there any one application that generates the most sort of like grotesque Teradata specific queries or are they all sort of guilty, equally guilty? Uh, all of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yep, so if you move to the next slide, uh, this is the overall architecture of, of HyperQ. This is our virtualization platform. So here on the left side, you have the, these legacy applications. Uh, they connect through a driver. Uh, they speak a protocol that's implemented by a driver, and this could be a standard driver like ODBC or JDBC, but it can also be a proprietary driver of the data warehouse uh, that is a kind of custom, speaks a custom protocol. And on the right-hand side, instead of the old data warehouse, you have one of the uh, supported data warehouses uh, that you want to move to. Uh, so in the box in the middle, we have the various components and uh, I probably cannot point now that I'm not presenting. Uh, but from left to right, uh, so it's not just about the SQL text, it's, it's also about understanding the, the protocol that the application speaks because we, we also don't wanna have the customer have to change those. So we do have a protocol engine that, um, that uh, understands the various messages that uh, are sent from the driver. Uh, and once we understood the message, we, we unpack the query out of that message and we give it to the next component, which is the, the thing in the middle, the translator. Uh, so that's the component that I'm actually gonna describe in more details. Uh, but the important part here is that the translator takes the input query expressed in the dialect of the source system and translates it into something that uh, can be run on the new uh, data warehouse. 
Uh, we also have other uh, things like metadata manager because we, we, we need to be able to access metadata in order to resolve the various uh, object references in the query. Um, and another important component is that when we run the query and we get the results back, we also need to package those results and send them in the format that the application expects them to be. So in some cases, we have to do things like type pre-mappings in case the type system is not exactly the same. Um, and also we have to package it in the message that the, the protocol uh, defines uh, for, 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 for returning results back to the, to the client. Because again, we don't want to change a single thing in the, in the way the application used to run against the old system. Uh, so next slide, please. So, I, I, I mean, maybe you'll get into this, but like there's different, sometimes there's different like behavior of like you built in functions and things like that. Like presumably like you, you, you accounted for all the possible things that people would execute on like on Snowflake or whatever, you know, BigQuery or whatever mm -hmm. on the other side. And like, you know that, I mean, I guess my question is how much of this is hand coded versus how much of this can be trained and learned? Um, good question. So we hard code the semantics because that's usually well defined in the, um, in the various uh, documentation uh, uh -huh. of, of, of the source and both the source and the target system. Uh, so we do make sure that uh, things have the same behavior. So we do make sure that uh, things return the same data types. Mm -hmm. And if not, we, we add explicit casts to actually make them return the same type. Uh, we don't do any learning of what the results should be because we, we, we have to be correct. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. So next slide. Uh, so, yeah, again, zooming in on the query translation framework, because to me, that's the most interesting part of the product, and that's the one that I've worked on most. Uh, so, again, we said we, there's a query that comes in, that query is expressing the dialect of, of, of the source system, uh, in our case, Teradata. Uh, so we have a parser. We have to parse that query. We uh, have the grammar rules of, of the source language encoded. And not surprisingly, the parser comes back with an abstract syntax tree, like most parsers do. Uh, so the next step, uh, if you can click the next slide, is uh, we actually have to bind this abstract syntax tree into something that is uh, semantically meaningful. Um, so uh, we, as part of that process, in the binder, we would uh, resolve uh, object references. Uh, so we know what tables are being referenced, what columns those tables have, uh, what types uh, the various columns and expressions are. And the result after this step is, uh, is very close to the relational algebra that you know from textbooks. Uh, so the result is another tree called extra, and it stands for extended relational algebra. Uh, but it's essentially a tree consisting of joins, group bys, and, uh, and other types of operators. Uh, so this is a more or less straightforward translation to an extra. And we may have to apply additional transformations to make that, that query tree be uh, executable or close to executable on the new system. Uh, and I'll show examples uh, what we do uh, with, with some constructs. But essentially, we have a transformation framework which applies uh, a variety of algebraic rules uh, to make the original uh, join tree or the original extra tree closer to uh, something that will be executed on the new system. So the result after the transformation step is again an extra tree. And that extra tree in the final step, we can feed to a serializer. We can click to the next slide. And what the serializer does is um, it will walk down that tree and will produce SQL text. Um, so that now can be sent to the, to the backend and executed. So, so again, I, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, stop me. So like that query writing thing, it's like the idea is, you know, like, you know, the target is BigQuery. And you know BigQuery can only handle maybe queries that, that do certain kind of nesting, nesting or have certain patterns. And therefore, you're, you have the, the rewriting specific to the, to the engine you're, you're going to, to put it towards. That is a very good question. Yes, uh, the correct okay. answer is yes. Uh, and I have examples later, so I'll, okay. I'll come back oh. to that. All right, sorry. All right, next. Next, please. Yeah, so this is a, a framework that uh, is modular and extensible, so you can add new features easily by implementing uh, new parser rules. You can implement transformations that, uh, as Andy uh, suggested, are specific to a particular system. Uh, you can also, also turn off transformations uh, because 
those database systems evolved. So in the future, if they add native support for something that you had a rewrite for, you can actually turn it off. And uh, that will make all the queries that use this construct now use the native construct. And if you think about it, if you, if you had to go through the manual translation of queries, even if the database system evolves, you will probably not want to go back and, uh, and rewrite those queries manually. But here, you, you, you basically take advantage of it with one step. So I have a few examples to just show you how things look. Um, so here's a simple query. Uh, you select from a table T and you have some equality predicate. So after parsing, you uh, have a AST that looks like this. Uh, so you think you're having a, to do a selection on top of a table T. Uh, but when you start binding, uh, well, first of all, you resolve T to an actual table uh, in an actual schema. So here DBO uh, is the default schema. So we pull the metadata for, for that one. Um, and when we start binding the equality predicate, we see that, uh, well, one of the columns comes from T, but the other one doesn't. And on most systems that will uh, raise an error because you forgot to reference S in, in, in the from clause. But on Terraria, that's actually pretty valid syntax. Uh, and the implicit um, uh, meaning of that is that you're actually joining the two tables. So after binding, instead of having a selection, you will end up with a join between the two tables, T and S. And something that I don't show in, this, uh, in these trees is that uh, as part of the binding, we also uh, build, uh, build up the um, properties of, of, uh, uh, at each of these levels. So for relational operators, we will derive things like what are the columns, what are the output column types, and so on, because those are then needed for binding the, the upper level. And if you've uh, done query optimization or something similar, that's, that's pretty standard. Uh, for scalar operators, we will um, derive things like what is the type of the expression? Is this expression nullable or not? Because that may uh, be handy later on if you want to apply transformations. Uh, so next this, slide, please. This is awful. Like, the, the, you can join something without declaring it? You can join something without declaring it. And uh, one other example that I wanted to uh, put in the slides, but I thought I will not have time to go over it, is you can also do stuff like select A is B, B, S, C, and so on. So basically reference variables or columns that were defined at the same level. Uh, um, so it, it makes for some, uh, yeah. I mean, I think my SQL, like my SQL, like they knew their syntax was de were deviating. So like they're trying to get more strict, like in every version. This is like some shit in the 80s that somebody wrote and they, they've been living with it for 30 years. This yep, and, and a lot of applications use it. So that, course, that's yes. what makes the whole problem so much harder. Yes, all right. Yep, so, so this is the, the next step after, after binding. We've kind of normalized the query a little bit so that it's kind of more uh, closer to relational algebra. Um, and then in the transformation framework, we implement this backend specific logic uh, for the various systems that we support. Uh, if something is not supported, we may have to rewrite it with, into something that is, uh, and I have examples for that later. Um, we also do some optimizations in that framework. Uh, for example, if you have a sequence of uh, insert statements that uh, target the same table, we can batch them into a single insert, which is usually much more efficient to execute, especially on a cloud data warehouse. Uh, we do things like common expression elimination, subquery unnesting, some th things that will help the downstream optimizer deal better with the query that we give it. And also, we do type enforcement, and that's to make sure that uh, the various functions and operators uh, return the same type uh, as they did on the original system. Because sometimes, even if the function looks the same, it may have uh, different requirements for, for the input argument. So maybe it doesn't work with uh, integer and big int, but it works if you cast one to the other. So we do that in the transformation framework too. Uh, next slide. So I have a few examples. Uh, so one is, uh, is simple. So you have a date arithmetic expression, which uh, just subtracts one date from another. And that is sometimes um, supported natively as an operator, but on other systems, you have to call a built-in function. Uh, so if you click to the next slide, so in some systems, you will have to uh, express this difference by just calling explicitly a date diff function. So that transformation will be enabled for those systems, but uh, will not be enabled for the ones that support it natively. So that's pretty simple. Uh, so the next 
example is, um, so if you remember the query that I showed you earlier, where um, on Teradata, it's perfectly fine to use dates and integers inter interchangeably. On other systems, that's not the case, then you may have to cast the date expression explicitly into an integer. And that happens with, uh, by, if you click to the next slide, there will be a tree. Basically, you extract the various components of the date and you plug it into this math expression that computes the integer. Um, so once you have this query tree, uh, you can then give it to the serializer and it will produce SQL that looks like this. Uh, and that's part of, a, of the larger query tree, so it will be a snippet of the SQL that will be sent to the database. Any questions so far? This is crazy. This is awesome. <laughs> it gets even more awesome. Next slide. So what I've shown you so far is uh, mostly algebraic rewrite rules, uh, where we assume that uh, whatever the query and the query constructs uh, that come in are, can be expressed with some other shape and form of, of, of a, a, a query tree. But that's not always the case. We, in some cases, we'll get a query that we cannot execute directly as is. And we might have to break it up into separate components uh, and run those and kind of combine the results in the mid-tier. Um, so some examples are kind of the more procedural constructs like macros, store procedures, recursive queries, and so on. Uh, another uh, famous example is uh, enforcing uniqueness constraints. Uh, so if your table had a key or a unique constraint defined, uh, those are very rarely portable because most of the cloud data warehouses decided not to implement uniqueness constraints. And if now if your application code uh, depends on data being properly deduped uh, in the target table, uh, you're running into, problem, uh, into trouble. So what we do is uh, we would essentially enforce the constraint on our end by um, what well, we keep track in our metadata store that there is a constraint, uh, first of all. And then if there's a DML operation that comes in, we would essentially run it in a transaction where we, where we would try to run the, the DML if it introduced any duplicates, we would roll back and return an error to the user. If not, we will commit the transaction. So that way we can emulate that same behavior in, in, in a set of queries instead of a single query only. So I promise I have an example uh, so that that one covers recursive queries. So, um, this query, you don't have to read the SQL test. So what it does is it, it is a query which computes all the employees uh, that report either directly or indirectly to a manager with a given ID. Uh, so that's a standard SQL construct. Uh, so if you click, uh, there'll be some little animation. Uh, it has this recursive uh, at the beginning to kind of warn the, the parser and the optimizer that is, this is a recursive query. Uh, in the base, that's kind of the upper half of the query, uh, we say, well, give me all the employees uh, whose manager has ID 10, uh, and union those uh, employees with everybody who reports to the uh, employees that you just, uh, that you just computed. So because the, this definition of reports uses itself, that's why it's recursive, um, when the system, downstream system, doesn't support recursion, we'll have to actually evaluate the recursion uh, on our end. So we would step through the, um, through the stages. Uh, so if you click once more, so we would first execute that base of the recursion. We'll find the employees that report to manager 10 directly. And then we would iterate over uh, until we find no more employees. So we'll basically join that uh, delta table with the with the original employees table until we don't add any more uh, records to the, to the Delta table. And the final result, we will just have to, uh, if you click once again, we'll just have to click, uh, sorry, yes, to read from that final work table, which contains all the entries that we computed uh, by running the recursive query through, uh, through Hypercube. And we have to also clean up some of the intermediate tables that we've created. So like, the the hypercube part has no data right like everything like how do you say this 
like the transaction thing you just mentioned that like that would be all um like you're maintaining state of the transactions in hypercube and then it's it's responsible for doing the lookup to say do 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 I constraint do I do I constraint violations and whatnot. So we assume that the downstream system gives us transactions. So we ah, can, okay, okay, okay. We, we don't. We try to stay away from implementing a transaction manager uh, because, well, there are smarter people that that sure. that have done that. So we assume that we can just do begin transaction. Uh, so we do send that as a query to the backend, and we do send the various create temp table, create uh, table insert into, and so on queries. Uh, but we kind of uh, handle the control flow. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to give you something more kind of deeper on the, on the implementation side of things. Uh, so we've implemented that whole uh, framework in Erlang, which is a functional programming language, uh, which is kind of awesome when you do want to do query rewrites because you start with a pattern, you transform it, and you produce a new pattern. Um, and give you kind of an, an idea of the depth and breadth of the implementation and what we support. I thought I'll run a little statistics. Uh, so I did that on the weekend. So that's the current snapshot of our implementation. So for Teradata, we have about 150 different um, parse node constructs. Uh, those get mapped to about 235 uh, relational operators, somewhat relational operators that includes um, DDL commands, utility commands, and, and uh, other things that are necessary to support the customer applications. And we currently have uh, almost 250 transformation rules that uh, that massage the query to uh, to make it work on the on the back end. Next slide, please. So I'm kind of coming towards the end of my talk, and I, I wanted to point out a few properties of of HyperQ. Uh, so one thing that is important is we're now in between the application and the and the database, and an important aspect of it is that we don't want to introduce overhead, and that's a question we commonly get asked. What about overhead? And we've we've measured it, and uh, we obviously ran experiments for our uh, signal papers. But most of the times, it's it's negligible because we we delegate the actual data processing to the uh, to the back end, uh, so we kind of have to handle things like metadata lookups and and translations. But those are uh, typically much uh, faster to execute. Uh, so at the worst case, we've seen something like 2% overhead, which for a virtualization framework is, is pretty acceptable. Uh, so the other important aspect is, uh, well, is there something you don't support? Or how much of the, of the language do you, do you actually support? And that's, again, an empirical result uh, that we've gotten. And the result is based on, on analyzing a number of customer workloads of millions of queries. And we've uh, discovered that there's uh, about 99.5% uh, support for the their data dialect of SQL. And that is important because our value proposition to customers is that they don't have to change anything. So we can't come up and say, look, we support only 50% of your, of your queries because that means the rest of, of, of the 100% will have to be uh, manually rewritten. And the thing that we don't support yet is either on our roadmap or is our features that we've decided not to support because there's little demand for those. So that's kind of more of a business decision. Can, can, so can, can you give an example of like something that like is in that 0.5% that you don't support? And actually, um, and out of curiosity, the ones you say, like you, you say, we're just not going to support this because there's low demand for it. Like, uh, I guess the first question is, how much work is it effort in your part to say, okay, here's this function that, that somebody wrote that's in, you know, from, from Teradata from 1989 that they'd still support. Like how much work does it take? How much effort does it take to say, okay, what is that function and how to actually convert it? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's sometimes uh, like one weeks, conscious. Uh, well, so if it's, if it's something that has a direct uh, corresponding feature on the back end, then it's... Sure a day worth of work. Uh, we've sometimes implemented custom UDFs uh, that occasionally make it into the built-in functions if we kind of make it a point with our partner warehouses that this is an important feature, mm -hmm. uh, which again is probably easy. Uh, there are other 
kind of bigger features, uh, especially the ones that need emulation, things like stored procedures, where uh, there's a variety of constructs that we need to support, like uh, error context handling and exceptions and, and all these things. So these are usually, uh, and again, I mean, we, we start with a simple implementation and we add the, uh, to the backlog uh, for things to implement based on what we see in the customer workloads. Uh, things that we've decided not to support, uh, something from the top of my head, uh, is something like xQuery. So there's some <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> xQuery functionality in Terraria. We said, well, yep. the 1% of queries that touch this, well, just hire an SI to help you rewrite those because there, <laughs> there's more important things. Yes. Okay. That's, that's a good response. All right. Um, and yeah, so the, the third point is uh, something that I didn't talk about, uh, but it's also important if you're, a, if you're an enterprise that's looking to migrate is uh, the others like beyond relational. Uh, we also support things like ETL tools and we map those ETL tools to the kind of the fast loaders of Teradata to the fast loaders of, of, of the target system um, so that it, it, the performance is still, uh, is still as expected. So out of curiosity, like, I mean, Teradata is, you know, it's from 1979. There's, I don't know how many different iterations of, of their drivers for ODBC or GDBC, like how many different versions are out there? Like, did you guys make an effort to say, let's go find every jar file or every version of GDBC that they support and just try to put that through your whole like testing pipeline to see what you support and don't, don't support? Or like, do you, you cut it off and at some point say we only support up to this version like how how bad was that actually supporting all the version versions of the teradata, teradata driver yeah so i think we from the teradata driver i think we support two or three major versions and again that's based on customer needs i think uh the oldest one is 13 and so we don't support anything before that and the kind of the majority of stuff is uh in teradata 15 and I think there's a couple of new things in Teradata 16, but it's pretty much backward compatible and the same. Got it. Okay. I just, so I, the reason I asked is I remember Mike was telling me that like in the early days of Vertica, you know, there's how much effort they went into just trying to ver support all different versions of Postgres GDBC that all the customers had. It was, it was a huge pain in the ass with big whack-a-mole. And my student, Matt, he got our, you know, he, we, our system runs the latest version of, of GDBC for, for Postgres. And it seems to work. We, what we haven't, we, we, don't, we don't have customers, we haven't looked to see how much harm is going to be support all the older protocols. Yeah, uh, again, it's kind of driven by customer demand. We've, sure. I think we've started with one of the versions initially. We've uh, kind of taken the spec of the protocol and implemented it. And then we saw, oh, there's some customers that are on older versions that differ significantly. So we went ahead and uh, kind of debugged sure. that before I engineered that one too. Got it, because they give you money so you, so you do it. Yeah. Yeah, but, <laughs> awesome. I mean, now that we've done, uh, it's applicable to all of them. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, so kind of the summary is that we provide the pretty extensive functionality and we don't uh, incur overhead. I guess, next slide. Uh, so this is kind of more of a marketing-y slide. Uh, I'm not sure Andy will like it, but again, we our value prop is that we do it for the customer. We enable those migrations and now they run in a significantly less time. Uh, I think the quote was uh, the original migration sometimes tend to run uh, three, four, five years and now it can be done in a few months. And uh, obviously it costs less money because you have to pay less people to, to do manual, manual stuff and rewrite queries and you also don't have to pay the Teradata license while you're migrating because now migration uh, is done much faster. So, so the migration time though is, is getting the data out of Teradata and shoving it into whatever backend thing. Like it, your thing is instantaneous, right? Like, like other than like maybe there's some functionality they don't support, but in theory, like they point it at datometry and it just, it just works. So, that, so the migration cost really is just moving the data, right? Uh, Yes, yes and no. I mean, obviously we're a startup or somewhat advanced startup, but uh, yeah. customers, the way, the way that the usually projects go is that uh, we start with a, with a, with a kind of workload analysis to see if we actually support them or not. Uh, and we have a, a tool that I don't show here and hopefully we'll be able to write a paper about it, but uh, it, it essentially runs millions of queries uh, kind of through a preview version of Hypercube. 
and it counts how many things we support. It spits out things that we don't support and we need to add to the backlog, uh, backlog if we are to support this customer. Um, uh, and that's kind of the first step. And if, if that, those numbers are convincing, we go ahead and we propose the implementation plan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, things that need to be implemented get implemented. Uh, the data itself, data is not static. So th there is this one-time migration of data, but usually you have to kind of uh, point your ETL uh, scripts to, to pump data into the, the new warehouse. Uh, so what customers typically do is uh, when they start a migration project is they run the, the two warehouses side by side for a few months and that helps them resolve uh, well, if there are any bugs that they see, but also kind of tune performance if they need to. And sometimes that involves us implementing transformations to make better use of the, of the data warehousing features that they now use, uh, but also kind of compare and make sure that the things are correct. So there's still some overhead into doing that, but there's no manual query, right, that needs to happen unless it falls into this 0.5% of the, of the features that we don't support. Right. Uh, so yeah, so there's still some overhead, but it's uh, typically much smaller because we don't do any manual rewrites. Okay, awesome. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so this was a recent case study with one of the UK retailers that migrated and if somebody's interested, there's a link, but essentially they report on how they migrated from Teradata to, to Azure uh, using datometry. And kind of coming to the end of my talk, uh, here I presented Datometry's Hypercube product, which is a virtualization framework that is this middleman between the application and the, and the database. So what it does, it, it decouples the application um, from the database. So now you can switch the database and not have to worry about uh, making your application run against the new system. Um, next slide. So we've published uh, a lot of that work. Uh, so my talk was mostly based on our two Sigma papers, our two most recent Sigma papers. So if anyone is interested, uh, please take a look at those. And that's all. Awesome. I, I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Um, all right. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for Lubelay now? Okay. Um, so I guess my question would be, what's harder? Is it harder to support um, a new backend data warehouse, or is it harder to support a new like front end, you know, exadata instead of teradata or something like mm -hmm. that? Or are they equally challenging? Um, since since we've mostly added backends, uh, that is relatively easy. Uh, assuming obviously that the backend uh, is kind of functional and has the usual uh, usual construct. So if it's something that doesn't let you run DML, then it's probably not that easy to add. But uh, if it's a fairly functional uh, backend, usually adding a new one involves implementing a metadata interface uh, that lets you look up metadata and again that that can be simple if if the database supports something like information schema because we don't have to change queries mm -hmm. um, uh, the the other thing that's different for new backends is the serializer component that that, that actually takes care of, of, of producing SQL and that is also fairly kind of common because we on the front side of things we have to worry about the various dialects and the various proprietary features but when we serialized SQL, we can stick to ANSI SQL or something that will be common across all these backends and just worry about the differences. So in terms of co-chairing, that's actually pretty compact too. Uh, for supporting a new front end system, um, that would uh, typically involve more work because you have to implement the parser. We have to yeah. make sure that the semantics um, is preserved across all these operators. Uh, so actually, I, I didn't show that, uh, but one of the earliest papers we had was, and actually when I started, we were uh, targeting not Teradata, but a different database called KDB. So this is a yep, of course. database. Yep. Uh, oh, that's not even in SQL. That's like the... the, the that's the, not the, SQL, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. that we, we were mapping everything to SQL, so kind of the, this internal extra representation or the origins of it that date back from the time when we supported KDB because we, we wanted to map things into SQL and we wanted to map things into a more relational uh, kind of 
uh, target system, uh, but the parser was obviously completely different because that's not SQL. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so, I mean, you know, KDB is just, I mean, the, the, mar the Teradata market is way larger than KDB, right? Like, so. Which explains sense. why we yeah, of course. Yeah. supporting KDB. Um, so uh, the other question I have is, is um, the, not for what, sorry. Um, the, the, the UDS stuff, um, that translation, I mean, so, so one, that's not parsing SQL, that's parsing now PLC or whatever, I don't know what Teradata it is, right? Like, like how, um, is it sort of the same steps or that's a little different, right? Cause that's like mm -hmm. mapping from one, one DSL to another DSL. Um, but are there semantics about the SQL inside of it that you can take advantage of to rewrite it, be more intelligent? I, I, does that make sense or no? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, so yeah, so stored procedures in Teradata are, yeah, essentially a bunch of SQL statements uh, that are connected with, with control flow. Like yep. if then else, uh, do that, if there's an exception or if you get this error from the backend, uh, raise this exception to the user or execute this function to the user and return the results to the user. So it's part of the same parser. So it's part of the, it's, it's still kind of SQL with control flow. And we do have extra nodes. We do have these uh, operators that express control flow nodes in the, oh, in the extra tree. Mm -hmm. So we don't really make a difference. Uh, we don't support truly procedural, uh, truly things like Python and so on. We kind of assume that this can be just, uh, if Python is a supported language in the new system, those can be just dropped in there. Okay. And what about the, the transaction stuff? I'm sort of curious about as well, because like, um, it's one thing to map SQL, right? But now, if, if there's if there's implicit semantics of the transaction of transactions that are that are you know that Teradata might do something different than 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 what you know BigQuery might do. Again, I, I realize these are these are data warehouses and people aren't running like hardcore OSP applications, but like, 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 are there variants in like isolation levels that you have to deal with from going from uh, one system to the next? Oh, you're asking the hard questions. Uh, yeah. So uh, there may be difference in isolation levels, but we try to stay away from those in the okay. sense that those are usually not as important to warehousing applications. Uh, we obviously want the target system to support transactions because they do show up and we do need them for, for some of our emulation, yes. uh, but not at the level where we have to worry about isolation levels. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, unless anybody else has a question, I, I have one last question. Anybody else? Okay, I'll ask you the question I, I like to ask everyone else. How stupid are your users? Like how, like when they come to you and they think datometry is gonna do X, Y, Z, and you're like, what are you talking about? This is, you're way off on this. Like, or are there people that like, if they're already sort of managing Teradata, they sort of have some intelligence about what the hell they're doing. And they're obviously coming to you because, you know, they're, they're, they're sophisticated enough to realize, you know, the path they're going down is not the right thing. And this is a better approach. Um, now I have to be careful because you're going to post this video online. I, I, so I, I, I have I, to be careful I, 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 how I answer this. this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so there's one difficulty, which is uh, the users that, well, those IT departments, the, the ones that are responsible for managing the Teradata instance are usually not really the business users that are writing the applications. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those people don't really know what's the business logic in those applications. And that's part of the kind of the deal that we don't want them to worry about the logic and we don't want them to worry about the implementation of, of or if it's going to be a manual rewrite about the kind of the correctness of those rewrites. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other one is um, since the interface, we preserve the Teradata interface. So anything that they used to know about Teradata now kind of holds uh, because they can still write or modify these applications if they want them. Uh, we also, obviously, if somebody is moving to the cloud, they probably want to take advantage of uh, what these cloud warehouses give you. So not kind of be stuck in the, in the 70s with Teradata, but develop new stuff. Uh, and that's no problem too, because, well, you migrate your stuff, you don't have to worry about uh, that migration project running over time. Yes. And once you're done, you can now start developing new applications or even changing and re kind of re-innovating or re-implementing stuff that you wanted to, but didn't want to couple it with the migration step. Got it, okay. 
and then I think, I mean, the marking slide is useful because like, what is this one? Oh, shit. I mean, the cost is, is, is massive, right? Like, because Teradata is so expensive, right? And then going to the cloud is, is a fraction of that. That's huge. Yep. Okay. And I mean, I, and I used to work at a database company and, and something that, I mean, I, I wasn't bothered with it so much back then, but uh, because of, well, I, I was developing this cool new database technology was that even though, you know, you can believe the data, your database is better, uh, it is still very hard to convince the customer to move to it because of that migration cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. And most, most of these database vendors usually target kind of greenfield opportunities where you develop your application from scratch, but not really kind of bite the, the full market with the old legacy applications. Yep, 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 yep. There's a reason why IBM still makes bank on IMS, right? That, that fucker's not going anywhere. Yep. Okay. This is awesome. Lewina, thank you for doing this. Thank you for, for sticking with us, even though it's technology issues.